So Israel settled in the land of the Amorites. After Moses had sent spies to Jazer, the Israelites captured its surrounding settlements and drove out the Amorites who were there. Then they turned and went up along the road toward Bashan. And Og, king of Bashan, and his whole army marched out to meet them in the battle at Adre. The Lord said to Moses, Do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him into your hands, along with his whole army and his land. Do to him what you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon. So they struck him down, together with his sons and his whole army, leaving them no survivors, and they took possession of his land. We had a great weekend yesterday, uh, Friday night and Saturday, with our uh, men's ministry that went on our annual retreat, and it was just fantastic, and I pray that the Lord will continue using that time away, and the commitments that were made, we will honor and, and stay committed to those decisions. In 1967, a Dutch archaeological uh, expedition led by H.J. Frankel discovered some plaster pieces, some fragments from a wall in the Jordan River Valley in a site there. Well, when they pieced these things together, they discovered that they were written in Aramaic, Aramaic and dated back to about 850 B.C. And when they started putting the fragments together, they noticed something pretty interesting. The name of Balaam, son of Beor, a seer of visions. And the tale goes on and describes an encounter where Baal receives a vision, a divine uh, mission from the Lord that's contrary to what his neighbors thought was going to happen. So was this referencing what we have in Numbers chapter 22? Who knows? But it is pretty interesting that we have a text in, in, in a site that's other than Scripture that's mentioning this very important character. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Numbers chapter 22. And as we start unpacking the story of Balaam and his donkey, you'll see that this is an important story that probably needs to be wrestled back from the children's ministry, especially in, in how it ends, because it's a very important message for us today. Well, a lot has happened in a week's worth of reading. When we left off, the children of Israel were kind of having some infighting, and they were fearful about going across and uh, in, in, in reclaiming the land that the Lord had promised them. Well, no longer are they pensive and insecure, and no longer are they afraid of their own shadow. In fact, these 40 years, while it's been some rough sledding through the desert, has done tremendous amount uh, to galvanize the people and to bring them together. If you think about it, some of the men that were, uh, most of the men at this point, that were afraid to cross over and fight for the Lord have all dropped one by one. So you have this new generation of young bucks that's being led by Joshua and Caleb. And Moses is still with them, but he is on his, his final days as we, we read this passage. And so they are really willing to follow the Lord and are, are trusting in him. And they're even trusting in him with military strength. Numbers 21 even references the book of the wars of the Lord. So apparently God's been up to them, and, and they have formed this army. And God is delivering people. And the passage that Shelby read this, uh, just a few moments ago talks about how God's people are on the move, and they easily defeat the Amorites at Jahaz for not allowing them access to the land. They'd ask if they could go through. and said, we, we won't go into your vineyards. We won't go and tap your wells to let us pass through. The people said no, and so the Lord says, we're going to make you pay for this. And then after that, they move up and take the Amorite stronghold at Heshbon. And then finally, they go up into the nation of Bashan at Edre. And so you see kind of this journey that they've gone on. Well, at this point, they turn south, and they start heading towards the Dead Sea. And they encamp along the, uh, the Jordan River right across from Jericho. And as you know, they're getting ready to, to head into the Promised Land. The only problem is the people of Moab don't know that God has told them not to, to go that far south. So you have the, the king of Moab is terrified that this horde of the Lord is going to continue coming and making their way into Moab. And so he starts counting up his army and it starts seeing what God's army is like. And he's like, militarily, I can't compete with what's coming towards us. So he tries to come up with something. And so... What he decides to do, the pagan ruler, 
Balak, king of Moab, decides to solicit the services of the most famous soothsayer of his day, kind of a rock star among the prophets, a man named Balaam from Babylon. Well, apparently Balaam has been gifted with the ability that if he sees something, he can bless someone and has the power that they actually receive blessings. And conversely, he can curse someone and their life becomes cursed. So it's a pretty incredible thing that you have this pagan person that God has gifted in this specific way. Well, this renowned divine was also known to perform his craft for money. Well, the law that's given at Sinai strictly prohibits this from taking place. You can't do it. But of course, he's not under the law because he's not a Jew. And to complicate things matter, in addition to his ability to dole out blessings and curses, Balaam was also given the ability to prophesy. He even prophesies about the star of Bethlehem and about the king of kings that will come forth through the children of Israel. So you have this man that God has gifted incredibly to be able to do these things. And he is a very distinguished and renowned person And he has the power and authority of God at times to to enact what he chooses to do. And he's been solicited to come and put a hex and a curse on God's chosen people. So the power comes from God, and he's been asked to use the power of God to go over and to put a hex and a curse on God's chosen people. How do you think that's going to work out for Balaam? Well, Balak, the king of Moab, sends an entourage loaded with cash to go and retrieve the Babylonian prophets. Let's see what happens in Numbers chapter 22, starting in verse 7. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination, to bring about this curse. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite princes stayed with him. God came to Balaam that night and asked, Who are these men that are with you? Balaam said to God, Well, well, well Balak's son is Zippor, the, the king of Moab sent me this message. A people that has come from Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. He says, don't do it. So the next day, Balaam wakes up, wakes up and, and he gathers these princes that have come from Moab, and he says, I'm sorry. I appreciate the offer. Thank you for thinking of me. Lord says I can't go. Please head on back and tell the king what my answer is. Well, Balaam doesn't take no for an answer. And the text tells us he sends a larger entourage, a more prestigious princes and i'm guessing carrying a larger sum of money for divination so they show up and knock on the store and said we're back and the offer has grown and so what does balaam said he says i appreciate you guys coming but even if balak were to offer me his palace loaded with silver and gold i can't step outside of what god wants me to do so we're in the store and we're going yes balaam gets it he's doing the right things But then he says, but maybe I misunderstood the Lord the first time. Why don't you guys spend the night and I'll go ask him a second time. So we get this in Numbers chapter 22 in verse 20. Since these men have come to summon you, this is the Lord's answer. Go with them, but only do what I tell you. Why? Why is this, why is there a reversal here? Why is there a no answer and then a yes answer? Well, Larry Wood points out in verse 20 represents the permissive will of God. It's not the direct will of God. He knows what the direct will of God is. God says, don't go. He wants you to do something that's separate and apart from my will. I don't want you to go. Then why is he allowing him to do it? Well, it's the permissive will of God. You've asked And now I'm going to allow you to do what you keep asking because obviously you want to do this. It's similar to a teenager wanting to go down at spring break to the beach. Is it the parents' will for you to go with this group of teenagers and you don't know who they are? 
No, it, it's not my will. But if you beg and plead and, and coerce and do everything else, eventually I'm going to wear down. My kids don't listen to this. But you, ha- you, re- you release them to your permissive will. But what do you do as a parent? Well, you give all kinds of stipulations. I want to know who's going on this trip. I want phone numbers. I want to know who the chaperone in charge is. I want to know where you're staying. I want to know what you're going to be up to, when your curfew is, and what SPF number on your sunscreen. I mean, everything. If you're going down there, there's going to be some parameters. And you better believe I'm going to make sure that these things take place. So God tells Balaam he can go if and only if you do exactly what I tell you to do. Numbers chapter 22 and verse 22. But God was very angry when he went. He hops on the donkey the next morning. And the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her to get her back onto the road. Okay, I understand the first reversal of no to yes, but why does it appear that the Lord is saying no all over again? Why this second reversal? Well, if you think about it, there are times when God calls someone, but there appears to be a strange twist in the story. If you think of, of Jacob, who is fleeing for his life from Esau, and he goes to his uh, uncle Laban's house and falls in love with Rachel and Leah. And they spend some time there. He works for a long period of time, and his herds grow, and the Lord blesses him. But there comes a point where there's a lot of friction between Laban and his sons and, and his servants there, and the Lord says, it's time. I'm calling you to go back to your homeland. And so what happens? Jacob loads up the, the wife and his kids, and they start heading out, and he has a confrontation with Laban. But then he knows up ahead is Esau. And so he has this night where he tries to separate and divide and conquer in case Esau wants to come after him. So he's all alone there in the desert. And it's at that point that the Lord comes in and basically accosts him and wrestles with him all night. And when he's holding on to him, what does the Lord do? He wrenches his hip socket where he's limping. And he's got to be asking, Lord, you called me to go on this trip. Why are you attacking me? Why the wrestling? And you also look at the story of Moses, who's called to be the, the deliverer of the children of Israel after 400 years of slavery. And so the Lord's called him to go back. And so he loads up Zipporah and, and the kids, and they talk with, with his father-in-law. The father-in-law gives his blessings. So let, let's start heading towards Egypt. And then the text tells us the Lord almost killed Moses. Why? Because one of his sons hadn't been circumcised. So Zippor's like, give me the flint knife. We'll take care of this. Okay? Lord has called him, but along the way, some growth needs to take place. In each instance, God did indeed want the individual to make the journey, but an issue, issue to settle first. I think in this case with Balaam, what God is saying is slow down. Make sure you know what you're going to be doing, and why you're going to be doing it. This is serious business. But isn't it interesting that he's going on this journey, and this thing happens, and this soothsayer, this visionary, is supposed to be able to see all these things, is totally blind to the spiritual reality that's that's taking place before him. So twice more, after the donkey steers off, and he, he beats this poor donkey while the donkey gets going, and he sees the angel again, he runs Balaam into a stone wall, and Balaam gets off and beats the donkey again, hops back on. And finally, when he gets into a narrow place where he can't turn to left or right, the donkey just sits down. And so, of course, Balaam hops off and just starts wailing on this poor beast until finally she had had enough. In Numbers chapter 22, in verse 30, says this, The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. Okay, this is a weird story, granted. But what's weird to me is not only that the donkey is talking, but that Balaam doesn't just freak out 
I mean, if Winston, our golden retriever, just says, you know, Brad, we, we need to talk about the food that you're serving me. I wouldn't go, well, well tell me, Winston, what, what's going on? I'd be, ah, Jill, you know, and running out. He just has a conversation with donkey. Like, oh, this makes perfectly good sense. But the donkey's telling him, I'm trying to, this isn't in my habit to do this. Look what was about to happen. And it says his eyes are opened up. I think it was interesting that it was the Lord who opened both the dumb donkey's mouth and the blind seer's eyes. When verse 32, the angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is reckless one before me. He said, the, the direction you're going, watch out. There's danger up ahead. I'm trying to get you to rethink this because where you're going, what you're going to be up to is very precarious. And he reminds the prophet of the deal because Balaam says, hey, if it's that big a deal, I'll just return home. He's like, no, you've gotten this far. But just remember, the Lord said, if you go on this journey, say only what I tell you to say and nothing else. Well, soon after, Balaam meets up with, Balaam meets up with Barak on the border. And so you see have the king waiting for him there. He's growing impatient. He's like, where you been? I called you. Did I not tell you it was urgent? Yet you sent the guys back, and now you're taking so long to get here. It's an urgent situation. I need you to act right now. It says, come on, let, let's go. And so they make their way into Moab, and when they stop for the night, it says that Barak got together some cattle and, and some sheep, and, and he sacrificed to the gods. Now, this wasn't Jehovah. He's sacrificing here to the gods of Moab. So the text tells them that Balaam received a portion of the animals that were being sacrificed. Okay, is he just getting, hey, I'll, I'll take that cut of meat? What's going on here? Well, at least some of the scholars think that the portion that Balaam was given was the liver of the animals, okay, that it held, held some special right, and as a diviner, that he would take these livers and prepare them in such a way that would bring favor according to the gods. So that's the thing that's going on. So he goes to sleep that night, and the next morning, it's time for the hired mercenary to do his thing. He says, all right, Balaam, we brought you here. You're a hired gun. What are you going to do? He says, well, I want you to gather your men, a bunch of rocks, and I want you to put together seven different altars. And on each of the altars, I want you to put a ram, and I want you to put a bull. Seven? Yep, seven. So they're working on this, and as they crank up the, the seven fires around him, he says, you men stay here. I'm going to climb up on the bluff so I'll be closer to the Lord and hear what the Lord has to say once he gives me a message. So he gives us this message in Numbers chapter 23, verses 7 through 10. So he comes back and he says, Balak brought me from Aram, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come, denounce Israel. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? From the rocky peaks, I see them. From the heights, I view them. I see a people who live and do not consider themselves one of the nations. They're, they're holy people. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of righteousness and may my end be like theirs. Guess who's not happy when he pronounces this? Barak's like, okay, in your contract it says, you're here to curse. You're not cursing, you're blessing them. You're even saying, man, they're such a good people, and they're so righteous, I want to die and be just like them. They're the enemy. Have you forgotten why I brought you here? And Barak says, what's the deal? Why are you doing this? Barak says, I don't think you understand the full scope of the problem. So he said, let's get off this bluff. Let's go down here. And he takes them to a field. He says, do you see all those tents? Do you see how many people are here? They're right on my border. At any moment, they could turn and take me. You've got to do something. He says, well, we'll give it another try. Why don't you get some rocks together and we'll build, let me guess, yeah, seven altars. Yeah, one, two, three. What should we put on? Huh, how about some bulls and some rams? Didn't we try this before? Yeah, let, let's give it another try. And so as they're offering up, he goes, 
Let me guess, you're going to go walk off and find out what God wants. Yeah, so he goes over here. He comes back, and the second time he brings curses? No, he brings more blessings. The king's like going, what have I done wrong? Have I brought in the wrong guy? A third time, Barak sets up seven more altars in another location. Seven more bulls, seven more rams. And Balaam repeats what the God, what God puts on his heart for the third time. In Numbers chapter 24, verses 6 and 7. Like the valleys, they spread out. Like gardens beside a river. Like the aloes planted by the Lord. Like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their seed will have abundant water. May those who bless you be blessed. And those who curse you be cursed. Verse 10 says that Barak's anger burned against Balaam. He says, not only have you not brought on curses, you have blessed these people three times. And if that's not enough, you put a curse on me because I'm the one trying to curse these people. What in the world is going on? And he reminds him, he said, there would have been a great payday if you had done what I'd asked you to perform as expected. But since you refused, in fact, you made the matter worse, it's time to go. I want you to leave. And he reminds him, hey, I told you from the get-go, I can only say what God wants me to say. So we're looking at the story, you're like going, yes, this man stood up in a foreign land against what the whole nation wanted him to do. He was God's man. He listened to God, not anyone else. And God brought about this great victory. If only the story could end there. Numbers chapter 31 records the conquest of the Midianites. Included in the death toll were the five kings of Midian and Balaam, the son of Beor, who was run through with a sword. Why did that happen? Was it a mistake? Friendly fire? Why was Balaam killed? It was no accident. According to verse 16, following Balaam's advice, the women of Moab and Midian were able to turn the hearts of the Israelites away from the Lord in what happened at Peor. Well, what did happen at Peor? Well, if you put together some different passages, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, you, you kind of see what happens after this, this third opportunity to provide curses doesn't materialize. Balak is preparing to send Balaam home empty-handed for refusing to curse the people of Israel. But Balaam apparently tells Balak how to defeat Israel. And he says, it's not going to come from curses from on high. If you want to destroy the nation of Israel, it's going to have to come from corruption and decay from within. Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 3 says this. When Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to their sacrifices to their gods. The people ate and bowed down there before their, these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, John shared that Balaam taught Balak how to entice Israel away from their holy living and their holy God by sending over the temple prostitutes from Moab and Midian to entice the Israelite men into worshiping Baal and eating of food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. Well, it was just a few that kind of crossed over and well, I kind of lost a few to those women. 24,000 men made the journey and crossed over and lost their lives because of the plague the Lord sent upon them. They were enticed by these women and were struck down by the Lord Thus, through the art of seduction, Balaam was able to accomplish what he couldn't do by pronouncing a curse. Balaam ultimately lost his life, according to 2 Peter 2 and verse 15, because he loved the wages of wickedness more than he loved his heavenly Father. What a terrible thing to be the epitaph for your life. Oh, he followed the letter of the law. I, I did exactly what God told me to do up to a point. 
But when it got to the point where I'm walking away after all of this and I'm walking away penniless, I couldn't do it. Faced with the possibility of this, he sells out his people that the Lord had commanded him to bless. And he lost his life in the process. What about us? What, what can we learn from this story? The first thing I want to encourage us to do is to listen to God. You know, Balaam did the right thing. He was in an important juncture in his life. Incredible amount of pressure on the line. And he's sitting there, and the first thing he does is he says, I've got to go to God in prayer. And God gives him his answer. It should have been done. He should have said, I want no part of this. God's asked me not to do it, but yet I'm going to come back. He comes back for a second time. And yes, the Lord allowed him to go, but along the way he did everything possible to slow down the progress, to get him to think about his actions, to say, this isn't my divine will. It's my permissive will. I'm going to allow it to happen. But please, think about what you're doing, even to the point of an intervention talk from his donkey. Keep him from going astray from this tempting proposition. This is for us. I think we need to realize that we have God's inspired word that, that can help us to see what God would have us to do in our life. We also have the word, Jesus Christ, that lived a perfect life. That if we're unsure exactly what God would have us to do, we see the heart of God lived out in Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. Jesus says, I've given you my spirit. And it's better to have the spirit of Christ living, the spirit of the Lord living in you than having Christ beside you. The Spirit of God will guide you and direct you and will make your path straight. And it's incredible what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. We have David that stepped outside of God's will and he was living in sin. And so he writes in Psalms chapter 31, he said, I, I felt like that when I was apart from God, I knew what I was doing was wrong, but I did it anyway. And when I felt that, I felt like my bones were wasting away and he put his heavy hand upon me. I couldn't breathe because of what God was doing. God says, I'm not done with you. God says, I want you to return to the past. God gives us his spirit to do that. He also gives us godly brothers and sisters that care about us. And I I have to tell you as a spiritual leader in the church that the hardest part of my calling is telling people what they need to hear when I see them stepping outside of God's will. And if you have a family member, if you have a friend, if you have a shepherd from the church, come and knock on your door, listen to them. It takes a tremendous amount of courage and it takes a tremendous amount of love not to just let you do your thing. Because there's always a price to pay when you go and confront someone, they'll throw everything up. If someone cares enough about you to to let Listen to what God is trying to tell through these people that care very much. You've got to do it. The second thing is we've got to join with God. To me, the key passage, the passage that that breaks my heart is Numbers 24, 1 and 2. Look look at that with me. To me, this is the key to this whole story. Now, when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not resort to sorcery as the other times. But he turned his face towards the desert. When Balaam looked out and saw Israel camp and camp tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God came upon him. Do you get the picture? He's got the desert behind him. He's got the people he's supposed to be cursing. But he gets up there, and when he's about to do this, he says, I'm not going to resort to my old ways. I'm not going to go back to these old paths because I've seen where they've led. I'm going to turn my face away from what I've done in the past, and I'm going to turn my face towards God's chosen people. I'm going to see them camp there, and I'm going to see that God is working with them. That's what I want. I want to be among the Lord's people. And it said the Lord filled him with his spirit. It was a mountaintop experience. But unfortunately, it did not have staying power in the life of Balaam. He walked away. He walked down from that mountain, and he he returned to his normal ways of divination and, and conniving in order to get his own personal glory. If only he could have hungered to remain in the service of the Lord. 
So we're called not only to listen to God, but to join with him as to what God would have us to be doing, using our gifts and talents to bless him and to spread the word of his kingdom. Finally, we're called to stand firm. Stand firm with God. You know, we can concentrate on the 24,000 that lost their lives, or we can count on all of the men of Israel that says, I'm not going across the border. I'm not going to do that. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed Baal Peor, but all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. He's like, you've seen what happened. You step outside of God's will and you live and, and worship to other idols in this way that's so despicable. He said, but you guys held. You guys stood fast. You guys stood firm in what's your belief. He says, you cross over into the, into the promised land. Keep doing that. You know, the temptations of Baal Peor are still alive with us this day. Unfortunately, it's much easier to cross that border, isn't it? To get involved in sexual immorality. To find ourselves going down paths where God would not have us to go down. And I'm talking to the men of this congregation. We have got to stand firm. We have got to link arm in arm and hold each other accountable. It's too incredibly tempting. It's too easy for things to to destroy our lives. We as a, a people have got to guard ourselves against these same seductions. We've got to stand firm. We've got to choose the new life that God is calling us to over the lust of this world. The Apostle John warns us not to love the things of this world, the cravings of man, the lust of our eyes, the worldly pursuits. He says all these things that you see the pagan nations run after, they're going to pass away. But we should rather strive to be, find ourselves in the will of God, which will last forever. You know, the story of Balaam has a tragic ending. He was separated from his heavenly father and killed at the hands of one of Lord's servants. But for each of us here, the final chapter is yet to be written. Amen? We have a decision. I don't know if you're, you're at a crisis point you're trying to figure out should you do this or should you do that, listen to what God is telling you. He will make it clear if you ask of him. If you find yourself going down a path that is separate and apart, man, Lord will, will let you know that. But he's calling you to join him on his mission, to use the gifts and talents and opportunities and the days that you have in that final chapter or chapters to be resigned over to him. And finally, we've got to stand, we've got to stand firm Stand firm with him to the end. I'm calling us as a people to remain within the will of our Heavenly Father. Let's stand.